Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, throughout this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with Mayor Sharon Schoenberg of the town of Assiniboine, Saskatchewan. But before we jump into that interview, we would like to take a moment and say that we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you have come to expect from us. Now, on to our interview with Mayor Sean Burke. Mayor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about yourself and your community. But before we get into your community, I want to talk about who you are, because I think that municipal politicians aren't really well known across Canada as our MPs and MLAs are. So I want to start with a basic question, but it's a crux of what the entire interview will be all about. And that is, Sharon, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, where did it come from? You know, growing up, I, I you know, and I'm not from Assiniboia. I'm actually an import from, from Regina. So I moved here many years ago uh, for a job, uh, which I ended up staying, getting married, uh, settling into Assiniboia. But, you know, I think when I first moved to this community many, many years ago, where I didn't know a single person, honest to God, not one person. I worked at a job. I didn't know one person and I thought, what the heck am I doing here? So because growing up in the city is a lot different than growing up in a town and I thought, oh dear, what have I done? But you know what? My, my coworkers encouraged me to get out, to volunteer, to meet people, to stay home on the weekend and actually get out. And going out and volunteering with a lot of different people, and a lot of different groups, I met a lot of people. But you know what? When I moved to this community, I, for whatever reason, I said to myself, I want to be mayor of this community one day. And, and it just, because I felt I had a lot to give, a lot to offer, but I wanted to do it at a higher level than just the volunteer part of it. Um, and I have volunteered on pretty much every board there is in this community, but it's just to be more involved with my community, make some decisions, make the place a better place to live, even if it's a little bit, but just make it better and, and have a say in, in what goes on in your community and, and, and be a leader maybe. I, you know what, it's, for me, it was just, I just something I wanted to do. And it was, I always have been interested. I did take some education post-secondary. Um, I was in school to become a lawyer and my, and my major was political science. So right off the get-go, I think I had this interest in, I don't want to say politics, but is certainly, I guess it is. And uh, on what level, I, I didn't know. But when I moved here and got into this town and got used to being here and, and loving this community, I thought, is this something I want to do one day? And I mean, I ran for council um, 10 years ago. I sat on council for three years. Um, I was involved in different groups. I sat on the school board here. People said to me, why be on the school board? You have no children. But for me, it was about helping to make decisions about the schools in this community. Very unbiased. I don't have children in this school or this school. I can make a decision based on no bias here. I'm just making a decision from what I see. It also gave me an opportunity to network with the educators in the community at a uh, network with a lot more people in the community, meeting more individuals, but still having that drive, like I said, being on council and then taking a step back and then wanting to run again. And I did run again. I ran for mayor eight years ago and I didn't win. And I thought next time around, maybe I'll try again. And my, my husband said, do you want the headache? And I said, <laughs> maybe not. 
<laughs> a husband after your heart, right? Do you want the headache? Well, you know, um, and so four years ago, again, during COVID, um, I had mentioned what I knew one of the, I knew the council, a small town, you know, who's on council. One of the counselors is my friend. I said to her, you know, I, I want to run for council. And she said, I said, I want to run. And she said, great, you'd be great as a counselor. And I said, no, no, no. I said, if I'm going to run, it's, it's all or nothing. And, and I feel I can do that job. I feel that with the support of others, I could do this job. And I decided to put my name in and, and, you know, you have those thoughts of, well, I'm not going to win. I mean, maybe the other guy's better. Who knows? Right. And, and cause you don't, and people are like, well, you're going to win, you're going to win, you're going to win. And I said, you don't know that right now, 60 some percent of the people showed up to vote, which was overwhelming. And here we are today going into year four. So where's that time gone? <laughs> well, there is a lot to unpack there, but I, I want to start sort of uh, with young Sharon, if that's okay. Was mom sure, and dad ahead. was mom and dad political? Did you grow up in a political house? Did you understand? Because you talk about going to university for yeah. political science, which I went as well. Right. I come from a right. political family. Did you as well, or was politics discussed at the dinner table? Not overly. I mean, we we listened to the news. My dad was well read. He was a salesman for a photocopier company and traveled all over so my mom was probably the main disciplinarian in in the family you know the old wait till your father gets home feel um my dad was 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 a strict man and and i'll tell you if you went out and he were to be home at 10 o'clock it wasn't 1001 it was 10 <laughs> o'clock but the, the good values of you know you want money for things go out and get a job. So I was 15. I worked in a retail environment. My mom worked in the retail environment. Who says we worked in the same store. She said, don't call me mom at work. Call me this. Right. But did we, did, were they involved in politics? No, they just, it was just something. Uh, so, you know, going and and I was one of those nerds that loved school. I still love school um, and learning always want to challenge the gray matter, but it's a matter, it's a matter of just my my whole inside just sort of watch the premiers and I watch the government I lived in and and it was like you know they're they're trying to make a difference and you know when you when you live in a community and you and you work I mean I have another job I, I work in a financial institution and I have for 18 years. So juggling both is, is I'm very busy, but it's just, I don't know. It's, it's a position that I always just something I always wanted to do inside of me. And, and the interest was always there. And it was always people in communities have complaints and they complain about this and they complain about this. You don't and, say and Sharon. All one of those <laughs> <laughs> newsflash <laughs> New, newsflash but, people complain so, so my, right so you know the options for me four years ago were yeah I had some of these complaints things were bothering me in the community people were saying to me you should run Sharon this is wrong and this okay well so and I thought to myself okay you have two options Sharon when you complain, you either come up with a solution and or 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 zip it, or or you or you challenge yourself to try and do something about it. And and I took that other route because I feel like I could make a difference. I feel like I could have a voice and make decisions. Listen, I'm a taxpayer too. So it's it's making those decisions, making the best decisions we can, but it's always just been an interest to me. And I and I honestly I don't even know where I, it came from within me because it's not what my brother does. It's not what my mom and dad were interested in, but it's just something that appealed to me. Is it what you expected? Four years, looking back on your first term oh. as a mayor, is it what you expected? Yes. Because looking, being on one side of the council table and then being on the other, making those decisions are two different worlds. 
because you Absolutely. have to make very tough decisions on a weekly basis for mm-hmm. you is the role of municipal government what you expect and is it is the role of municipal government what you think people expect from their municipal leaders when you talk to people of your community i think it's i knew there would be a huge learning curve um and and you know what even today after going into our fourth year it's still learning you you learn all the time and and it's the first year is you know you're put in a room with with six other individuals and you're like here try to get along most of the time and and there you go now Pass in budget. those days right <laughs> in those days it was covid so if we wanted to sit and have a meeting as as council just to have a, a just to talk with each other we had to come to council chambers because we had to stick six feet apart right so we couldn't meet in a coffee shop because we couldn't sit at the same table. So it was very difficult the first while. I think we've grown accustomed to each other. I find the position very rewarding. I, I can't, I am truly honored and blessed to be this person in this community. And I honestly, Chris, I still drive down the street and go, I can't believe I'm the mayor of this community. I can't. It's, it's, it is a little surreal. It's, it's people address you in public. You see people at the gas station and, or they, and, you know, they'll introduce you as your worship. And I'm almost not laughing at that when people say that because it's, I'm a very humble person. I'm, I'm very real. I'm very down to earth. Um, I, I wanted to come into this position being the person I am um, and not changing for people, but there are tough decisions to make. And, and you're not always the nice guy. And, but at the end of the day, you have to do what's best for the community and what information has been given to you with the dollars that you have to work with. And with your council, try to make the best decisions possible for the community. And that's not always the easiest thing to do. And you do your best at what you've been given for information and it's, it's working with the others and hearing their opinions and, you know, democracy is a wonderful thing, but it's, it's at the, we just, we come together and we gel as a team and we've grown accustomed to working with each other as council. And it's, I tell you, you know, I just, I would love for people to be able to, and I've said this, I would love for people to be able to sit on the other side of the fence just to see how it goes because it truly is eye-opening it's it's you see the the community in a whole different perspective my my phone doesn't necessarily have a lot maybe it has some vacation pictures on it but i'm driving down a highway going look at this road right i'm excited i'm excited about this i'm excited about infrastructure i want to talk about water plants and landfills and it's exciting to me it's exciting to me to make progress and move our community forward so to be part of that? Are you kidding me? Who wouldn't want to do that job? You, you mentioned something that is very telling. You you just said that you have to make the deci- some decisions that are for the good of the community. How do you know you're doing good for the community? How do you know that the decisions you're making are in the best interest of all the community? Because after four years in office, I guarantee you, you know that not 100% of the people are going to agree with everything that you agree think is good for the community. So how do you balance what is right and what is good with the understanding that some people are just going to have to be upset with you? Well, I mean... You, you, we're, again, we're, we're a small community, so we're, we're 2,400 people. Um, we work on a base of, of other communities around us. I'm out and about all the time on the street. I'm in the coffee shops. I'm in the grocery stores. And let me tell you, Chris, people have a problem with something. They have no problem telling me. And, and whether it's via Facebook Messenger hey, listen, I know this isn't the way to tell you this, but, well, you just did. You know, it's it's hearing people in the community and seeing them on the street 
having the conversation at the post office, having the conversation in the grocery store. No, uh, some of the decisions we've made maybe haven't been popular and are there still issues at hand that we are dealing with? Absolutely, that's any community. But when you talk about the majority of people in the community and, and you have the, the little ladies at the bingo hall going, you're such a good mayor. You're such a good mayor. And I said, well, you know what? Thank you. And I'll pass that along to the rest of my crew because honestly, it takes a village to run this town. And a lot of these people make me look good sometimes. And it's listening to the people out there. And, you know, we have, you want to be a delegation? We welcome people to come to our council meetings. You want to be a delegation at our council meeting? You want to be a delegation at our recreation committee meeting? Come on in. We're, we're always willing to listen to people. What, you know, maybe it's a complaint, but what's your solution? Like come to us with some potential solutions, but it's it, always having the ear in the community as do the rest of my counselors. They're always willing to listen, listen to people and bring it forward, bring it to us and let's, let's talk about it. And maybe it isn't, maybe it is a great idea. Maybe it's not. You try to make the most people happy that you can. And I know the first year I, it, it, you know, stuff kind of, you took it a little personally because, and I'm not saying you develop a thick skin, but you, 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 you took things personally and it was a, it was a hit at, at the town. And, and then you, you get into the role and you take a step back and you, you learn to absorb that information and say, Hey, you know, they're coming to you because of this. Okay, what's the solution? What can we do to try and maybe we can fix this, maybe we can't. But listening to people, listening to who are these people in this community. And that's the key is, and and like I said, some of them have no problem reaching out. And I'm very accessible. I, I, I'm not afraid to talk to anybody. I'm not afraid to um, not pick up the phone. I'm, you know what, you want to talk to me, come and talk to me. How important is it to listen to not just the people who, who agree, but the people who don't agree with you? Because you're as mayor, you're not in yes. Regina doing your job. You're not doing your job in Ottawa. You're not the partisanship. You are a neutral entity in your community right. that you are right. looking after everyone, not the liberals or conservatives right. or the NDPs or the Saskatchewan party. You are the mayor. <laughs> How important is it for you to listen to yeah. people who disagree with you and even agree with you? Well, I mean, obviously it's easy to, to listen to those that agree with you. I mean, you're, you're on the <laughs> same page, um, but it's like no brainer, but uh, the people that disagree, it's just as important. It's just as important. It's just as important to hear their point of view. It's, Im it's important to not be listening so that you're listening to respond to them. It's, it's listening so that they're heard because a lot of times they just want to be heard and, and they may have, and, and, and sometimes it's a matter of pointing them in a direction of, well, you know what? I, yeah, I want to hear it. Well, you know, you always, you always love hearing the good, but sometimes you want to hear the not so good because you need to know that you need to know what's going on if that's sitting in a coffee shop and listening to people talk about this that and whatever it is you need to listen to it because there are people in this community too and you know it's it's taking the time to thank them for talking to you and whether you disagree or or agree at the end of the conversation they want to be heard you know we had a council uh our council meetings for the last 10 12 years we've had this one gentleman who comes pretty much to every single meeting and he comes as the public and he's concerned about water. We're always concerned about water in a community and he comes and he comes and he's gotten 10 years older and he has a walker now and he sends me information packages. And I said to my administration, I said, you know what? He never says anything because it's public. He never wants to be a delegation but he sits and he listens and he tells me in the co-op parking lot, he tells me how, you know, he cuts out the articles that I have. Let's have him at a meeting. Let's have him at a public works meeting and let's talk, let's have him have his say. And he's come to a few of our public works meetings, but you know what? 
he gets to say what he thinks. And, and for him, he enjoys that. He enjoys, first of all, it was for him, it was being acknowledged that, because I remember him when I sat on council 10 years ago at the meetings and he came in and he left and he came, okay, what's, what's going on with this guy? Let's have him at a meeting. And we've had him at a few. Give us your ideas. Talk about water. You go around town taking pictures of this snow bank and that water dam and this and that. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you think the solutions are. And he offers up information and pictures and all sorts of things. And it's like, well, this is, you know, potentially helpful. And, and it's eye-opening for us going, someone actually cares enough about their community to do this. The least we can do is sit and listen to him. I appreciate it's your honesty thing. there. It, it truly is. It truly is a good thing to have that. Um, uh, before we turn to this, the town as a whole, I want to ask one last question. And I think it's an important question that I get, uh, I ask all the time, but I, I, I want to know from a small town perspective, does the average resident in your community understand the jurisdictional roles that the government plays compared to other levels of government? When people are asking you questions, are they talking about provincial issues? Are they talking about federal issues? Or do they understand that if I need to talk about healthcare and education, I'm going to my MLA. If I need to talk about the passport or what's going on with health mandates, particularly during COVID-19, I'm going to talk to my MP. Or are you seeing a blurring of jurisdictional lines and your residents don't care about those lines and want you to address them as mayor, as the person closest to them? Well, and I... You know, I can sit back and I can see the different levels because I understand that. But does the average person? I don't think so. And I think because you're the closest ear to them and you're the most relatable that. And now we are very lucky. Our our MLA lives in our community. Um, he's also the Minister of Agriculture and Highways. So his office is actually right beside my paying job, I'll call it. Um, that's where his office is. So I talk with his assistant quite often and we have, you know, a lot of great conversations and our, our MLA is, is we're so thankful to have such support from this gentleman, but the relationship that we have with him is a good one in the fact that we know we can reach out to him. But in, in regards to your question, I don't, I think the average person is, you know, there's, there's those that know where to go when they have issues about healthcare, but um, I would think a lot of the public, they just want to come and they just want to talk to someone right now. They don't want to phone them. They see me on the street. They want to talk healthcare. Maybe there was a service disruption at the hospital. Um, maybe there was this going on with policing, whatever it may be, but it's taking that information and, and part of the responsibility is not only to direct people to my office to to um, if it's town related to talk about things like that, but higher up, it's like, you know what, you have a question about that. And that's a good question, but you might be best if you stop by MLA's office because that would be his realm and his wheelhouse. And, and he would be able to, or his assistant would be able to point you in the direction because that's more of a provincial thing. It's not necessarily, yes, it does affect us at a town level, but it's a more provincially regulated issue. And so it's, it's sometimes it's the directing of ways and, and listening to the people, but saying, you know what, that's maybe an, a law enforcement issue and maybe contact the RCMP, here's the number or stop by the detachment, whatever, you know, but it's, it's a lot of time. It's, you feel like you're somewhat of a traffic director and saying, yeah, that's our issue. <laughs> and I know sometimes the, uh, you know, for, for town issues, the, the girls in the office will say to me, Sharon, stop, stop. <laughs> and, you know, stop just writing all this stuff down and just get them to call us. And I said, I, I will, because then it does take some responsibility off me. But I said, also, I said, you have to understand my job. And how I feel my job is, is to listen to people. I need to listen to these people. These are the people that voted for me. Maybe some didn't, maybe some did. But part of my job is to listen. 
and and listen well but it's also yeah you direct people but i are the lines blurred yeah i'd say so but do people really they just want to be heard and and wherever they go to get it that's all they want people just want to listen but not agree more with you on that one um I want to turn to my second segment because I'm cautious of time and I know you're a busy mayor and I want to talk about the town as a whole. But before I do this, I'm going to preface this question by saying this. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is a conversation and the mayor's opinion. So your worship. Mayor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what would you say is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Assiniboia today? I mean, we can we can talk about generalized issues about, you know, I think people are concerned about, um, you know, they have the landfill, the water issues, infrastructure, you know, and that that's in any community, you know, infrastructure is huge, but you know, in a, in a small community like the one we have here, um, you look at longevity and sustainability and you look about down the road about where we see ourselves in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So, you know, people living in a small and let's face it, we're not it's it's how do we drive folks into this community? How do we drive services into this community business wise? How do we sustain our community in the long run? And and we're getting it, you know, we're an older demographics, uh, me included. Um, We're not, we're seeing a lot of young people here, but I'm not a young person. Um, I'd like to be sometimes, but, uh, you know, it's the sustainability and longevity of the community and, and the success of, and the planning of how we, progress forward and and grow as a community. So it's always something we're thinking about and planning for. And, and yeah, you could plan for a year down the road, but, but, you know, and we're not always going to be the council of the day, but how do we continue that forward into the next council? How do we take our vision and go forward with that, hoping that the next councils continue on with, with our vision of how we see Assiniboia growing and thriving in, 2050 right where do we see ourselves so it's always that forward thinking of we need to sustain and we need to thrive and we need to grow so how do we go about doing that so you basically just asked asked my next follow-up question is how do you do that because you're right. And I think you, Assiniboia is not uh, alone in this situation where you're struggling with the re- attraction and retention of residents and services. So what do you see as your role as mayor and in sort of essence council as a whole, ensuring that you do have that sustainability and that longevity outlook that you're so passionate about that in 2050, you're not just the same community you are today, you are bigger and better. Well, I mean, as, as a council, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we've, we've, we've done this last three years and, and we've really, we've really gone full tilt. Um, We came in, there was a council and mayor for eight years and, and honestly, kudos to them, but they, they got tired. And, and eight years is a long time. So we came in as a whole new council. There was not one person that transferred over. We uh, released our CAO that was currently here within 30 days of being on council. And we got ourselves a new CAO. This CAO has been a CAO in different communities for over 30 years. So he's very strong in the position, um, very open to our policy, but we, we figure we're at that point now where we've we've we're progressing, but it's making plans for you know we're we know we're going to have to deal with, we're we're doing some more strategic planning next year than we have ever done. It's not a matter of let's just go and and keep going here because we got to think about and we've been thinking about so many different things because we're all over and I'm so thankful for my council that are so passionate about the community and so into making it better that they are so involved with 
let's talk about the water plant. Let's get these engineers on what we need to do to sustain our water for the next 50 years. What, what do we have to plan for there? So we've got engineers working on that. We're looking at infrastructure. We need paving done. Okay, well, we need to fix the infrastructure. So it's, it's planning ahead. It's also developing, you know, we're, we're potentially thinking about developing a subdivision out here. We talk about planning and development about, you know, we have a new $18 million recreational facility that just opened up a year ago, September. Now, if you don't think that that's a drawing card to this community, oh my goodness. The tournaments, now, now we have a good issue. Now it's an issue, but it's a good problem. Now we need more hotel space. So now it's looking for who do we get? We need to reach out to these people. We need more hotel rooms. And it's 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 the businesses we have. Oh my God, we have a very vibrant chamber. We have such great businesses in this community. But it's that forward thinking of we need to get this, we need to get this, we need to have this. And and we're the healthcare, I mean, we're very lucky to have a hospital here. I'm very involved with health services here in the community because we have had some issues at our hospital with disruptions and and COVID didn't help. But I have weekly meetings, not weekly, sorry, monthly meetings with with the with the health division to talk about how can we support you? Where are we at? What's going on in the hospital? We are lucky in 2400 people, we have six physicians. We have two dentists, we have chiropractors, we have ear specialists, we have eye doctor place. We have, but you remember too that we're a hub. So we have outlying communities of about a total of 10,000 people that service this area. We have farm implement dealers, we have grain terminals, we have car dealership, we have, you know, the services and amenities of this community. So we have three schools, we have, but you know, we're seeing a lot of younger people moving here. Younger people staying here, younger people going to get a degree, coming back to our hospital to work. We have people returning to the community because small town is safe to raise your kids. You know, it's a good place. You can't go to the hockey rink and see a seven-year-old because don't misbehave because I know who your parents are, right? You know, you... But that facility in itself is, and I can talk about that for hours, but it's it's all that we have to offer, but it's promoting ourselves, it's marketing ourselves, it's getting out there and being seen and, you know, having a, having a meeting here where we had just recently, we had 19 other communities here for, for SUMA. And it, you know, the, the amenities, they, the, a lot of the people were like, oh my God, I can't believe you have all this. Like, you're so lucky. We are lucky. But it's it's planning for that longevity and going out and, and we have an energetic crew at our office here who are movers and shakers. And they're always on top of stuff. And they're always thinking about this is what we got to do in planning and development. And are we going to do a space here? And the recreation is on top of things. And what is she planning for next year for stuff? And it's, it's always, we're always thinking of things and let's try this and we're always open to new things to try uh you know and and just to specialize in different things and we're just always on the go we we were going to take this year as our coast year and and we were just going to go let's just be the normal council and we'll just go through well we've been nothing but i mean 110 miles an hour full tilt and i don't see 2024 being any different um how do you balance that though? Because you you are as council have to look at the forward thinking where the city is going, where the community is going, where what do we need to improve the community? But if I go talk to a hundred people in your community tomorrow, which I'm going to be doing, not tomorrow, but in 2024, I will be stopping in the Sitaboya. Um, Yay. and if I ask a hundred people what their biggest issue is. They're all going to give me different issues. They're going to tell me some okay. things that they think are important to them. You, at the end of the day, as council, as mayor, understand that you have a small amount of money, that you cannot run deficits, and you have to pick, at the end of the day, the winners and losers. And I say that respectfully, because not everyone is going to get what they want. 
how do you ensure that the viability of your community in 20 years is there with the understanding that you can't forget about the people here in the community today? You know, you, you, you nailed it on the head about, you know, we have a certain amount of tax dollars available to us. We plan our budget every year. We've already had our pre-budget meeting um, over a month ago to plan for 2024. So we're just finalizing that. It's, it's trying to maintain the status quo here with the people here to try and, you know, keep the ones here that we have certainly. And, you know, you want to make it affordable for people. So you want to, okay, so if you need to raise taxes, but at the same time, you've got to walk a fine line there. You know, we know everything costs a lot of money nowadays and it's, it is tough for people to live, but it's, it's balancing that budget to say, we can afford to do these projects. You know, we talk about sidewalks and paving and, and, and I'll bet you, I'll bet you if you asked a hundred people today, what their main issue is, it'd be our main street that needs paving, but it's, but it's also a highway. So we've done our part with the infrastructure. Now we wait for the department of highways and the, in the ministry of highways in our province to make that decision that they're paving it. But it's, it's for us, it's trying to be as fiscally responsible to the taxpayer that we can be. And, and people understand, you know, I, I think the culture has shifted in our community uh, with our town, you know, organization and, and the employees out there. In any given day, you know, you, you would be before, you would drive down the street and you wouldn't see a single town person out. You see them out all the time now. And perception is everything. So you know what? People see them out working. They see them out getting things done. Okay, no, their sidewalk didn't get done this year, but there was a sidewalk in front of the church that's falling apart. So we have to pick our priorities and, and not everyone's sidewalk is going to get done and not every person's street is going to get paved. But are people address, willing to accept that? You know, they, they understand when they, when they see what work got done and don't think people won't drive over to that area to see what exactly <laughs> it looked like. Cause they do. I kid no. you not. <laughs> Oh, yeah. They'll take a photo of it too and be like, well, it could have been better. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, we did some, you know, we probably put in, you know, and I know it's a small town, but I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars gone in the last few years. No sidewalks got done, no paving got done, nothing got done. So you can imagine when we roll into town, literally how much how many projects we had to do and we're playing catch up and and so we put the money in and, and we try to be transparent with our with our uh, as transparent as we can with the public i mean we have a news reporter that comes to our council meetings she reports she throws it in the paper people come up to us and talk about this that or whatever we try and answer their questions the best we can but it's 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 when people can see things are getting done I had a comment from a guy at a hockey rink a couple years ago. This was our old rink. And he said, you know what? If I see things are getting done in this community, I don't mind paying an extra couple of dollars on my taxes because things are happening. And people have that perception where if they see things getting completed, they see things getting done. The majority of people are like, we're okay with this because we're making progress. I, I am very cautious of time here, and I just realized we're at the 40-minute mark, and I have not gotten to my last segment here, so hopefully you have a few <laughs> extra minutes uh, to chat. But I want to talk about my favorite subject, and it's tourism. I don't mm -hmm. think municipalities talk about tourism as much as they should, and that's just my own personal perspective, but here we are. So <laughs> I've got to ask, as someone who is about to come to Assiniboia later on in 2024, possibly before or after the SUMA conference, what are some of the highlights? What are some of the hidden treasures in your community? And I say community as in surrounding area as well, that people need to visit while they're in Assiniboia. Well, well, I honestly, I think first and foremost, if I don't mention our, uh, our Southland Co-op Center that, like I said, is an, is an $18 million project. A group of individuals in this community uh, had a dream 
and through provincial and federal funding, as well as, um, uh, you know, contributions from individuals and RMs and towns. I mean, we couldn't be who we are without our partnerships with our outlying communities and, and RMs and towns because they building those relationships just makes us even stronger. But this facility is bar none, probably one of the best facilities I've ever seen. It's got the NHL hockey rink. It has a virtual room that's about 30 different virtual games. It has a climbing wall. It has a has a room for a pickleball court. It has a walking track. It has a uh, teen center where we can sell memberships. Kids can come and hang out, play video games, do whatever they want. Um, but we've hosted a WHL game this year with Swift Current and Moose Jaw, which was sold out. We try and run the facility all year round. We had the Saskatchewan Country Music Awards here in June, where we had all of the best Saskatchewan country music artists here for three days. We put on a heck of a show. Um, you know, we had Washboard Union as our as our main entertainment for the weekend. Uh, but it's it's quite a facility. And, and right across from it, we have the Prince of Wales. So the Prince of Wales complex was aptly named after Prince Charles. Many years ago, he was here to put the shovel in the ground. Um, it's got a movie theater. It's got a library. It's got an auditorium. It's got the curling rink. It's got businesses upstairs. We have our own FM um, country music radio station here in, in, in Assiniboia. So we're very lucky to have that. We have Steve Huber from Cat Country. We've got the swimming pool down at the south end of town, which is jam-packed all summer. Um, kids will come. So we have a lot of parents that live here. Their kids will come home to book their kids into swimming lessons all summer here. So we have kids coming home all summer for 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 swimming lessons, golf wow. courses. We have three golf courses within 50 kilometers here. Beautiful, beautiful courses. We have Willow Bunch, we have Assiniboia, and we have Thompson Lake. So provincial parks, we have Thompson Lake Provincial Park, Willow Bunch, we have... Um, down south, about 35 minutes, we have the St. Victor Petroglyphs, which there's an archaeological, uh, it's called St. Victor. There is actual um, glyphs in the carvings of, of, you can take a sunset tour. My husband is part of the group. They do a sunset tour where you can actually view the glyphs in the, the stone. It's incredible to see. And it's one of the missed hidden treasures of this of this area, I feel, because it doesn't seem to always get the recognition it deserves. Well, I, I we have our museum. Go. <laughs> you should go, and I could get you a private tour. Let's do it, you and me. But, absolutely, we're in. We have our museum. We just helped our museum. Uh, they've got a, a private collector. We've got an antique car collection. It was one person's collection. We have a safari exhibit collection there. We just finished a nine-hole putting mini golf over there this summer disc golf is in the in the plans at some point in here um, we have the Sherniac art gallery my god so for those of us who are lucky enough to know bill Sherniac, uh, he's a gentleman from just outside of uh, cinnaboy here uh, he passed away just a couple years ago and I, I sit on the Sherniac art board gallery one of the best art galleries in this province if not the country this by the way is the majority of the artwork in there is his own private collection. So unbelievable. We feature different artists. The manager at the art gallery is always getting new artists in there for things. We have concerts in there. We have, you know, in the summertime, we have an art retreat a whole week. 20, 25, 30 artists come to town. We have a whole week of arts. July 1st, That's that goes from at the parade in the morning till two o'clock when the art gallery has the blacktop hop where we have a dance and things. We have a demo derby. We have a concert in the park. It sounds like you, know, you have the, something for everything, something for everyone. Oh sorry. God. And, and you know, that's what we do. We, we, we go hard with what we do and, and we've got, people are never with, you know, people say in a small town, they're like, what do you do in a small town? There's nothing to do. Are you, are you kidding me? Honest to God, I could be doing something every night of the week. I just went to a concert last Saturday night. A young gentleman from Alberta, uh, Trevor Panzik, put on a concert. 
awesome. We do a festival of trees uh, fundraiser goes to the to the healthcare foundation here and to the Prince of Wales complex. Um, we probably raise fifty to sixty thousand dollars in an evening. We've raised close to a million dollars in the twenty years that that festival wow. of trees, and I've been part of it for fifteen. It's incredible. You know, people dress up and have a nice night out, but we raise a lot of money. It's who wouldn't want to live here? Are you kidding me? Well, it's the best place in the world. That brings me to my last question here, Your Worship, and it's an important question. It's the million dollar question that oh. I've asked every single municipal leader because I think every municipal leader knows how to answer it. But I think it's always great to have it on the record. So that way, 20 years from now, when someone's listening to this, they can understand <laughs> what the community is all about. But in your opinion, what makes the town of Assiniboia such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? You know, when I always ask what our greatest asset is, or our, it, it is truly our people. Um, our people in this community are, are bar none. They are volunteers. They are, it's, it's just that, you know, we're, we're large in a sense that we have so much to offer, but we're small in the sense that you feel safe to live here. And it's, it's, it's just me growing up in the city, like I said, and not knowing anybody when I moved here, I can truly say that this is my home because I love, I love this community. I love what it has to offer, but I love the people. I love the people here. They're very, you know what, when they ask you how you are, they really want to know how you are. They, they're not just saying it to make conversation. If I drive down the street, I can bet you I have 10 people waving at me, right? It's when I ask you how you are, Chris, I'm asking you because I care what you have to say. I'm not saying, how are you just because I'm trying to make some conversation because I feel like I should talk to you. I actually care what, what you have to say. So it's, it's, it's the treasure of the individuals that live here and the history of the community and, and the families that have grown up here. My husband came, grew up in this community. And, and so he knows everybody. And if he doesn't know them, I certainly do. But um, it's, you're the perfect it's husband the wife duo, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, we're 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 pretty. Uh, he's older than me, so he's slowed down a little. So I'm still the social director in the house. But um, it's it's always busy. There's always something to do. And there's always, you know, um, things to be involved in. And, and when you're a newcomer in town, it's it's we we try to grab onto those people and we say, hey, what are you interested in? What do you want to do? Do you want to do this? Do you have kids? How about this? You know, I had a new doctor in town and 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 she just came here from Edmonton and she's like, my kids are worried there's no sports. I said, are you kidding me? What what do you need to do? Right. So it's it's welcoming them in and 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 giving them ability to the new Ukrainian families that have come to town. You know, we've got a group that is bringing those people in here and getting them settled in and finding them jobs. And I mean, there, there are still jobs available everywhere because let's face it, the world is short. Um, but it's, it's, it's just a great community to live in. I just, you got to see it to believe it. I'm looking forward to coming to visit in 2024, but before well, I do I'm that... excited to have you here. Oh, I'm excited too. Let's do it. Uh, it's going to be a fun excitement. It's good. I'm going to go see the cliffs with you and get a private tour. Well, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, but before I let you I know go, someone that knows someone. <laughs> the, tr the true sign of a mayor of a small town right there. I know someone absolutely. who knows someone. Um, Sharon, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. This is a being an honest to goodness, great conversation. Um, you, you truly embody the ambassadorship of what a small town mayor should be. And I've only chatted you with you for 45 minutes, close to an hour. But it sounds like you have the best interest of your community at heart. And I thank you so much for sharing oh. that passion with my viewers and my listeners for this short period of time. And I will certainly make sure I stop in Assiniboia later on in 2024 and we'll sit down and have that coffee that, and we'll continue this conversation. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And I'm, I'm honored to have been able to do this. I mean, 
anytime you get a chance to promote your community, I'm in because it's a great place to be. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission. Now, as we ramp up, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with our latest conversations, but you're playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please visit our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you have come to expect from us. Once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in Canada. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.